Welcome to the underground, the Steel City Underground, the black and gold standard for Pittsburgh Steelers coverage. Now, here are your hosts, Brian E. Roach and Zach Meckler. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of the Steel City Underground podcast. My name is Brian E. Roach, the host who doesn't like toast, but I'd almost give a toast tonight. I would uh, provide joy and happiness to the world because the preseason is over. We're moving on into the regular season of Steelers football. I can't wait for that to happen. Um, And uh, Joe Kuzma, who would normally be with me here this evening discussing the game that just ended, uh, is unavailable. And so graciously stepping in, our friend, the professor of football, Zach Meckler, is here. Zach, how are you doing tonight? Not too bad. I'm pretty happy considering the fact that after months and months and months of waiting, we're finally looking forward to some real meaningful football so we can actually uh, put all this guessing behind us and get some actual real stuff ahead of us to look forward to. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm quite excited. Yeah, I can't I can't wait to see consistent games played by guys who are not going to be at Walmart the next week. <laughs> um, I think, you know, th- for those who don't know, the Steelers dropped this game, so they're going to end the p- preseason 3-1. and one. Uh, they do not win the Super Bowl of preseason. Oh well, who cares? Uh, that makes their you know their official record still zero and zero. Just you know, so everybody's clear. Um, they dropped the game to the Panthers, uh, losing the game twenty five to nineteen. In what did not have a, a a game that I would say was sloppy, <laughs> to say the least. Um, but, uh, I mean, I'm just going to run through a couple things real quick here. Uh, the Steelers' rushing attack uh, could probably not be called an attack. Uh, they mount, they managed to get uh, 14 carries for a total of 18 yards. Benny Snell had eight carries for 12. Uh, Josh Dobbs had one for 11. Uh, Devlin Hodges had one for three. And uh, McMillan had one for two. Unfortunately, uh, Terrell Edmonds, or, or is, it, is it Terrell? No, it's not Terrell. What's the running back's name? Uh, Trey Edmonds. Trey Edmonds. Yes, I should have known that. It's just like Trey Griffey. Trey Edmonds, three for minus 10. Um, running was not uh, really uh, being very productive uh, tonight. Uh, on the passing side, Devlin Hodges played the entire second half. Pretty much uh, he had uh, 20 attempts, 10 completions, 73 yards, a passer rating of a wonderful 38.1. And uh, Mason Rudolph uh, was probably the most consistent passer in the game tonight. 7 of 11, 125 yards. He had one touchdown uh, and 132.8 rating. Josh Dobbs opened the game, went 3 for 5, 21 yards uh, for a 69, nice, .6 rating. Um, And, you know, I I think the goal of of always of this uh, fourth preseason game obviously is is for guys who are on the the bubble so to speak um maybe they got a chance to make the the 53 maybe they don't maybe they're you know guys trying to make sure they earn their way onto at least the practice squad um and you know let's start with the quarterbacks um it was clear to me uh, i'm you know neither again i don't think either quarterback was stupendous i don't think either quarterback made watching them uh, made me go, wow, that's definitely the guy. But Josh Dobbs did not have a good game. He did not have a good start. Um, you know, his passes were erratic. He made some bad decisions, I thought. Uh, and it was clear that of the two, Mason Rudolph had earned a number two job if anybody was not certain. Now, Mike Tomlin in his press conference, I think, was asked about that, and he still wasn't willing to say that. But I think it's pretty clear uh, Mason Rudolph earned the number two position. And, you know, he also had what I thought was one of the nicest throws in the game, um, the touchdown that he did throw to, I think, Holton. And, you know, did you see anything that would contradict any of that, or is that the way you're viewing it as well? Yeah, no, I thought that uh, Dobbs' issues against the uh, Panthers were pretty much the same thing we've seen from him um, all offseason or all summer. You know, you've seen him make some really nice athletic plays, but then just the erratic throws, the decision-making, like the one that struck my mind was the one throw that he rolls out right and then throws back across your body, and you're taught from a young age to not make that read. And, I mean, it was behind James Washington, and he should be thankful that it wasn't picked off because it was an ugly throw. Yep. Um, 
And there's just a lot of erratic decision makings and just inconsistencies with his arm strength and with his ball placement. You know, I think all uh, preseason, you've seen Mason Rudolph kind of consistently do things well. Um, I don't think he was spectacular tonight, you know, but I think you kind of felt different whenever he came into the game. The offense kind of seemed to pick itself up a little bit, and it didn't seem like it was the same group of guys out there, and it was the same supporting cast for the most part going against the same defense, and it kind of lifted up there, you know, seeing him go you could see him going through his progressions he's a lot he's much more poised in the pocket um you know he's able to make those deep throws that like you said that pass to johnny holton was very nice um i i think over the last three or four games including training camp on top of it i think mason Rudolph is going to be the steelers number two quarterback and i i don't think it's as close i think mike tomlin's kind of just keeping it kind of tight-lipped at this point until things are official and we kind of see how things uh pan out with the overall 53-man roster but I'd be amazed at this point after watching these guys go at it for the last uh, two months. I'd be amazed if Rudolph wasn't Ben's primary backup once the season starts next week. Yeah, I, I, I just can't see it being any other way uh, based on what we saw tonight. Um, and that brings us to the third quarterback that played tonight, Devlin Hodges, Mr. Duck Dynasty himself. Uh, look, I, you know, I know Steelers Nation falls in love with these guys who are – lower on the totem pole. They show a lot of grit. They show a lot of determination. They look really good playing against guys, again, who are going to be playing at Walmart uh, or, you know, working at Walmart or, or someplace else looking for work uh, come, you know, this Saturday. I don't think – well, obviously, clearly, 38.1 uh, quarterback rating. Hodges did not have a good night. But to be fair to him, the offensive line in front of him had a worse night than he did. <laughs> because uh, he was under constant duress. He got a little better as the game progressed. But again, he was it was not a good night or a good half of football for, for Hodges. I, I know there's a lot of people uh, out there in Steelers Nation who think the Steelers should either cut Josh Dobbs, trade Josh Dobbs, and of course that'll be for like a number two pick or something crazy like that because that's, <laughs> that's just the way it works. Yeah. Um, if the Steelers want to trade you, you must just whoever they trade with must give us what we want. Um, I just don't see it. Um, I, I I don't have anything against Delvin Hodges or Devlin Hodges, but I you know based on this performance, I just don't see it. I I cannot really conceive of a scenario that he is on the fifty three and Josh Dobbs isn't. Other than if the Steelers do happen to get a crazy offer for a trade. Um, and it's for Josh Dobbs. It's not going to be inconceivable that somebody talks to them about Mason Rudolph, and I know that, that Steelers Nation would lose their collective poo-poo if that was what they did. Um, I don't think they'll do that because I don't think they can go into the season with Josh Dobbs and Devlin Hodges as the two backups to Ben. Um, so, you know, we'll have, to, we'll have to see. But my guess is, based on what we've seen, uh, you know, Mason Rudolph is the number two, Josh Dobbs is the number three, and Devlin Hodges is not going to be on the practice squad, folks. I, I, I know people keep saying put a quarterback on the practice squad, but it's a waste of a practice squad spot. He will do nothing for the entire season, and that's not why you got guys on the practice squad. So that's not going to happen. Um, what did you see out of uh, our, our boy Duck Dynasty tonight? What do you think uh, his future holds? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to give a lot of the issue to the line and the fact there were a couple of drops, but at the same time, it wasn't a great game by him by any means. You know, he was he seemed like a lot more anxious out there, almost like he kind of knew the uh, ramifications of this game for him and his future in the NFL, um, not even just with the Steelers, just in general. Um, and I think that kind of played a big part to why he was kind of as, as scattered out there as he was. But, you know, touching base on the trade value and whatnot, you have to think about uh, the fact that do you really want to give – a guy up like Dobbs, you're not going to get any type of return on him in the event that Ben would go down, then you're going to need a new backup at that point in time. And if Rudolph were to go, you know, it's a, it's a snowball effect. You don't want to weaken your roster because of that. And then we look at Mason Rudolph as a trade target. No one in the league is going to give him anything more than an original round draft pick for a trade with him. If you get anything less than that, you kind of, you know, you're wasting the time, the fact that you even selected him with a third round pick last year. So that's why I'll envision Rudolph being a legitimate target. If anyone would be, it was Dobbs. But after the performance tonight, I don't really think Dobbs has any trade value, which means I think he's settled in that third spot, and I'd be amazed if Hodges um, made a push for the spot you know, on the roster. So I think realistically you're going to see a scenario where Hodges just gets cut and waived. 
I do think he lands somewhere on a practice squad or as a number three um, somewhere for a team that doesn't have nearly the depth that quarterback the Steelers have right now. Um, but I think everything kind of seemed to settle itself out tonight and over the last couple of weeks. We're going to have Ben, Rudolph, Dobbs, Hodges on its way out. And you know, it's, we get, like you said, we get infatuated with these undrafted free agents, um, especially ones that have some of the raw skills that uh, Hodges has. He's not a bad quarterback. You know, he has a hell of an arm. Um, he's intelligent. He makes some of the, some good reads, and he has some you know above average athleticism. But you know he's not he's not going to beat out Rudolph. And I just think Dobbs they Dobbs knows the system. He gives you kind of an athletic aspect of a quarterback that can give you something to play with in the event that you ever need to go in there. Yeah, um, kind of build that offense around him. So you know I think everything settled itself out. I'm not really. I feel bad for Hodges. The offensive line gave him nothing to work with tonight. That was one of the worst offensive line performances I've seen, backups or otherwise. Um, you know, but it's the reality of it, and that's what's the that's what's rough about these fourth preseason games is the, that negative scenario happens, and sometimes that can be the difference maker, and you got to ride or die with it. All right, now I want to talk about the wide receivers now, um, because there was a wide receiver who who made a good. Um, had a, you know essentially he had a good game uh you know he scored a touchdown he had another nice long pass um a uh, reception that he caught uh, from i think from Dobbs and had Dobbs put uh i can't remember was actually that's not fair cuz i can't put it on it the first long ball that Johnny Holton caught was that from Dobbs or was that from Rudolph honestly i i <laughs> i regrettably stopped paying attention after i watched Dobbs you know kind of- what? It, it, I, I can answer my own question. Josh Dobbs had 21 yards passing. It was it was from Rudolph. <laughs> um, you know, and he made he made his case. Here's an example of a guy who made his case for why he should be on the roster. Now, this is not a case that says I need to be in the receiving rotation high up and be the number five receiver. This is a case that if you're going to keep six, you got to keep me. Um, and he, you know, he tried to make his case on special teams, but I think that's still going to be an important part of it, but his role, if John, John, uh, if Holton gets on the, on the roster, it will be as like that gunner type, the way uh, Darius Hayward Bay was a sixth receiver, um, unless he bumps, uh, Mr. Hardhat, Eli Rogers off the roster. Um, and I'll tell you, I didn't. Eli didn't have a good game either, and it wasn't a good look. The one ball that he could have caught, the long ball that that was thrown to him, that it looked like had he got his head around quicker and and been paying attention, he would have had. And I actually feel like there was another a throw that was to him earlier in the game where he was, again, not anticipating it, didn't expect to be the guy who was going to be targeted, and and didn't react to it well. Um, but, uh, Eli had two, two targets and one reception. So I guess I'm wrong. I guess it wasn't him, uh, that I'm thinking of because I know the one big miss was the target that was deep. I I've been unimpressed with Eli during this process. And I thought, I really honestly thought I'd give more. I know Ben likes him. I know the Steelers like him, but you know, speaking, uh, if the receiving group is, is Juju, Dante Moncrief, um, James Washington, uh, Ryan Switzer, and and then a fifth guy being probably um, Deontay Johnson. Yeah, Deontay Johnson. Is if it's Eli or Johnny Holton, who who do you keep at this point? I mean, quite frankly, I think Eli Rogers has a lot working against him. I think Deontay Spencer kind of worked his way out. Unfortunately, I think he was too inconsistent. He didn't get enough opportunities. But I think when you're looking at Holton and Rogers. Rogers key, I think, was going to be his ability to kind of help out in special teams as a return man. It seems like the Steelers have pretty much established at this point in time they're going to roll with Switzer and Johnson back on punts and kicks, um, which eliminates Rogers there. You didn't see Rogers tag a whole lot of other special teams usage outside of, you know, um, his abilities as a returner, which we didn't see a whole lot there. So all he was really getting was time on offense. You think about his role as kind of a primary slot guy. You have Switzer who um, got the start last week and this week in the slot over Rodgers, kind of solidify himself in that way. You have Juju who can play the big slot pretty well. And, you know, and by pretty well, I mean at an elite level. And, you know, you have, you have some other guys there that shift around and play on the inside like Deontay Johnson. So you're looking at a scenario Rodgers isn't going to see the offense on the field very much, you know. So I think you get away from there. Bolton has proven, I think, by being a solid special teams contributor to this training camp, kind of in the same realm that DHB did. 
which you hear, you've heard that comparison all summer long because they're built exactly the same and have very similar games. Um, he has experience as a vertical threat, and we've seen him have these splash plays as a vertical threat on offense, which outside of James Washington, you know, Juju Smith-Schuster has those 97-yard touchdowns, but he's not really a deep threat. James Washington's a deep threat, but Johnny Holden has the ability to blow a top off a of defense with his 4-4 speed. You know, so I think he gives you an, an option as a deep, deep, deep roster player to potentially have something that can go in there and contribute on special teams as a gunner, as a kickoff return or kickoff coverage guy, um, and be efficient in that manner, kind of like what they had since they lost DHB. So honestly, I think slowly, slowly but surely, Holton's been the guy that's been flying under the radar the entire training camp period. I think he gives you something you don't have with Rodgers. And I think the writing is kind of turning onto the wall. The little amount of money they have invested in Rodgers and the upside you potentially get with Holton. I, I think Holton made himself a very good case for being on this 53-man roster when the dust settles. Yeah, I mean, again, we're depending on them uh, to keep six receivers. And, and they may or they may not. But uh, I, I kind of feel like if they do, it's Johnny Holton that's going to be that sixth one and not Eli Rogers. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody else, I mean, I think Trey Griffey has a chance to land on the practice squad again. Deontay Spencer has a chance to get a practice squad uh, spot. But, you know, there was really, really and honestly, at best, there was one receiving uh, position that was going to be up for grabs um, because you just knew – the five, the first five spots are pretty much going to be locked up. We've said that from the get go, um, and so unfortunately, you know, I think it, it's going to be, uh, you know, the guy who can give them the most flexibility. And yeah, I think that's Johnny Holton right now. Which I will be honest, I wouldn't have said that four weeks ago. No, nope. um, but I after after seeing the what he's been able to do in in the preseason, I kind of think that's the case. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is. Benny Snell football. There was there was a, a tremendous amount of hype. Maybe it's from Kentucky guys. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> a tremendous amount of hype about Benny Snell. Now I'll tell you here. Let me give you the upside that I've I've seen. He's a better receiver than I thought he was uh, going to be. I thought I think he's done a nice job when he's when he's had to catch the ball out of the backfield. And from that standpoint, I I I've, I've been more impressed. He had three uh, targets, two receptions for twenty three yards. Uh, tonight along of 13 so that's good the downside is he looks slow to me he does not look like he has that extra gear to get you know escape uh, guys who are closing on him to break away and I don't know that I expected him to have that but I didn't expect him to look this slow Um, and you know he has not done what I consider to be a great job um, running the ball and I don't, I, you know, I, this was, like I said, eight for 12. That's an, a yard and a half average. Well, that's not, that's not, again, this is against the JV in, in most cases. That's not a good night. Uh, had a lot of negative uh, uh, plays. So, I mean, I don't know uh, whether he's got a, a lock on a roster spot or not. Um, I don't know that they could get him onto the practice squad because I don't know that somebody else who, who, feels like oh we can make it happen uh might not pick him up if if they did cut him or waived him but uh what do you think what do you think i mean i know this is what a guy that they invested a third round pick in fourth fourth round fourth round pick in um you know it it is it's like a, a a white flag if you cut him uh you know in his first year but i'll tell you i expected a lot more yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I was disappointed this preseason with him, but I also think this is going to be the same exact type of red shirt year. I don't think they cut him. I, I think you look at the other running backs on the roster, I don't think any of them showed anything either. So they're going to obviously keep the guy that you spend a fourth-round draft pick on. But I think you look at um, the two most recent Steelers draft picks of running back, James Conner and Jalen Samuels, they all kind of had that red shirt refreshment year you know, with the exception of Samuels, who was forced to play. Um, but they all went through the season. They all cut about 10, 15 pounds, had this new workout regime, reformed their body, reformed the craft, and came in the, the, uh, their next second season with a completely different player. I think it's going to be very similar. He, he, he reminds me a lot of James Conner when he came out. Conner lacked that burst. Conner was kind of just a bowling ball that fell forward, and that was it. Now we see a much more dynamic, multi-purpose running back who still has the body of that big-time, you know, bruiser, 
but he he can get away from guys. He can hit that second gear and then boom, take off. And I think Snell will hopefully get to that point. I think he's shown enough um, during practices and when obviously that doesn't mean anything because you want to see him do perform in the games. But at the same time, we never really saw him get the opportunity in these games to also play with like the Steelers top line, which as we all know is one of the three best offensive lines in the NFL. You know, so I think you have the opportunity to get him in those. I don't think it'd be spectacular. I think he's very clearly entrenched at best third running back on the depth chart. But I think his performance gives you some flexibility to potentially carry four. Like if you feel Trey Edmonds could be a potential better uh, player at that spot, or if you're in, in, in the uh, McMillan or Malik Williams camp to see if they can do anything. But I just think based on the lackluster performance of some of these other guys, Snell has a place on this roster. But he and he'll be active because they're not going to keep just two running backs active on the on the depth chart. Um, but I'd be surprised if he sees any more than maybe three carries, four carries all season, five carries. He's just he's, he's not at that point yet. You want to see him kind of go and treat this as a learning experience and head into 2020 with more of a off season under his belt, reform his body, get some burst and explosion to his game, and see if he can take that jump like James Conner did and Jalen Samuels appears to be making this year. Yeah, I mean, it, I don't know. It feels different to me than James Conner, and and far be it for me to criticize the professor of football. But, uh, I, I you know I lo- I I remember looking at you know uh, training camp because we were out there a couple days of training camp on, in, during Conner's rookie year, and you know he 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 just to me I remembered, and again it could be rose colored glasses. I remember him looking faster than Snell does right now. Um, and having more of an acceleration, not necessarily, uh, you know, to beat all odds. And I agree. I think him him dropping weight and and reforming himself has made him a better back. But I feel like we definitely it, it was different. It just felt different to me. Um, so I, I you know I basically agree with you. I don't think they're going to cut him. I, I just because it's been so under the bar from what I've seen so far. You know, you do start to go. Well, would they? Um, I don't think they will, uh, unless they really feel like they can sneak him onto the practice squad um, and give him his red shirt that way. Because I think there's going to be a lot of weeks where he doesn't get a hat, even as the third running back. Um, you know, if if everybody stays healthy, he may not he may not get a hat. Um, so he may be on the 53, but he may not play uh, or be eligible to play. We'll have to wait and see how it how it pans out. Um, I think there is a chance that uh, Trey Edmonds could get could make the team. Um, he, not so much tonight. Obviously, three three carries for minus ten yards, not so good. But I thought he looked better in the previous preseason game. Yes. Um, and other than James Conner and Jalen Samuels, that's really all that stood out to me because for the most part, the running backs beyond those first two haven't looked that good. Um, no. So. From the offensive standpoint, and mm-hmm. and we're talking about now, you know, the Steelers were hit with a a what felt like a never ending series of uh, holding calls. You know, got them into like a what a first and thirty, and and they would have been a first and forty if uh, Carolina hadn't had some pity on them and decided not to take the penalty. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and and it just happened far too often. I mean, I think a couple of them were on. Uh, uh, Gerald Hawkins, one one or two was on somebody else that uh, I I can't remember his name, um, but I'm I'm sure at best he he's a, he, his hope is practice squad, and I don't think he's even going to be eligible for that. Um, it was an underwhelming performance by the offensive line tonight uh, for whoever was in there, and while it was hard to see on on the coverage on TV. Um, did anybody stand out to you as 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 either extraordinarily holding their own or really not good? <laughs> um, I mean, I thought collectively it was a very bad performance. I mean, <laughs> the I think the LSU boys, Garrett Brumfield and uh, Gerald Hawkins. I mean, I think they both they're both on their way out. I think the Hawkins experiment's done, which is a shame because I was a big fan of his coming out. You know, I don't think you start as many games in the SEC on the offensive line as. He does without having some level of talent, but he just with the injuries, you could tell he's very clearly behind other guys because he hasn't been able to be there consistently. Um, you know, I think I think uh, Fred Johnson's going to continue to make a push for the roster. I think he's either I think he's a lock at the minimum for the practice squad, but I think he has a legitimate chance of being moved up. Um, 
on making the 53 and just being one of those inactive guys every week. I think Derwin Gray has a chance to make a uh, spot on the practice squad. Um, I think he's shown enough versatility to at least try to work with him and kind of mold him into something else, kind of be like the the new age swing guy. Um, but all in all, I mean, there's a lot of guys on that offensive line that were just there for the ride. And I hate yeah. to say it, with my love of off- all things offensive line, they just they weren't there. you know. And, and you expect that. These are all second and third string guys that – Honestly, might not even make a practice squad elsewhere in the league. They might just be on their way out. I'd be shocked if Gerald Hawkins gets picked up. I'd be shocked if Garrett Brumfeld gets picked up. Um, I think Patrick Morris has a chance to be picked up. He's been a consistently solid guy. Um, I thought he has a chance to be at the Steelers practice squad. And if Fred Johnson makes the 53, I think Patrick Morris has a chance to be on the on the practice squad. But I, I, it was hard to pick out any type of standouts. Zach Banner might be my one standout. I think he's been consistently solid. Um, not great, but solid throughout this preseason. I think he actually has a really inside chance of making. I think he's dedicated himself. The team loves him. He's a mauler. I mean, he, when he when he flips the switch on, there's not a whole lot you can do to, to get out of his way. I mean, he's going to bury him to the ground. It doesn't right. matter finding that consistency. Um, but this was this was a forgettable night. You know, for as, as a O line guy, I couldn't watch it. It, it was it was too much. Standing around, seeing no lanes, quarterbacks having no time to throw. It was very painful to watch. But um, you know, best of luck to these guys. I hope that some of them find an opportunity to go elsewhere and you know stick around in the league for a little bit to hopefully latch on. But it just it wasn't it wasn't the type of tape you want if you're trying to convince teams that you belong in the NFL. Yeah, it, it felt like there was a lot of lack of communication on this line tonight. Um, and just poor execution. Uh, and clearly, they could not run block to save their lives um, no. tonight. So, and, and, you know, you mentioned Zach Banner, who I agree, I think has been solid to above the line pretty much. Um, even if one guy is having a decent night, if the other four are, are stinking the, the joint up, um, you know, that it's, it's kind of going to go unnoticed. Uh, there's only so much you can do. I mean, poor Josh Dobbs had a, you know, a bad snap. Um, that was given to him, uh, and as I said, Delvin Hodges was running for his life, and even Mason Rudolph didn't have tons of time uh, to to survey things. He had to move around in the pocket a lot uh, and do some escaping because you know the the offensive line just wasn't doing a great job. Um, so on the upside, because <laughs> the offense was definitely. Not, not really a, an, an upside kind of place. On the up, upside, the first snap off the ball, Devin Bush, uh, you know, runs almost across the entire field to get a running back for a very short gain. Uh, again, showing that side to side speed. Uh, you did see there was a couple plays where either early on where I thought he 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 either made a bad decision uh, or got fooled on on a fake. And, and was allowing a receiver to get underneath him where his coverage wasn't as good as it should have been. But for the most part, again, I think he only played, uh, you know, maybe not, maybe the fir- full first half, but maybe he was out uh, late in the second quarter. Uh, but we, again, we still get the example of, of what we expect from Devin Bush. He still looked good um, and, you know, looked like he has – uh, the kind of speed and playmaking ability we're hoping that he does. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm still sticking with my my claim I've made multiple times, and it seems now the NFL is also starting to jump on. I, I think he's going to end up being the front runner for defensive player or defensive rookie of the year as long as he can stay healthy. I mean, I think he has that type of playmaking ability, and just simply put, the opportunity is going to be there. I mean, he's going to be playing a lot early and often. Um, you know, he's going to be playing. I, Guarantee you he's heavily in the game plan against New England um, week one. You know, So I think he's going to be the guy that's constantly on the ball. I think the mistakes you saw, I think they're real mistakes, and he's made those mistakes throughout the uh, preseason. It's the same type of stuff you dealt with with Ryan Chazier in his first yep. year where you know he makes some tremendous splash play that shows off everything of his intelligence, his football IQ, his instincts, his athleticism, his hard-hitting ability – and the next play, he gets beat over the top by a receiver, a tight end, and has to track down the play for a gain of 15. You know, so those fans are going to have to realize that those mistakes are going to happen. He's still a young player. He just turned 21. Um, he's still trying to figure it all out. The fact that he's at the point he is right now is is absolutely amazing. Um, so the mistakes are going to happen. There's going to be some lapses in judgment, lapses in error on the field. Um, but he's going to make up with it for – 
uh, of 12 tackle, 14 tackle output, you know, one interception and a sack. Like he'll make up for it. I'm not worried about him right now. I think I think everything that he, we've seen from him so far this preseason has been as advertised. And like I said, I, I think right now it's hard to find another guy in the league on that side of the ball who is going to be more pressed to have uh, the odds in their favor for defensive rookie of the year right now as we're speaking um, than Devin Bush. Yeah. Um, I thought Cam Sutton had a solid game, got an interception. Um, and I think he's had a solid preseason. Uh, I thought, you know, the Steelers had, again, they had six sacks. I think Spillane had a sack, which was a, a that was a, a, a lay in the wood sack, man. It was a nice one. Mm-hmm. Um, Elliot had a sack. Uh, and I think Isaiah Bugs and um, uh, Sutton Smith, uh, they shared a sack. Uh, Koontz had a sack. And then that guy, <laughs> Tuz, Tuzar Skipper, that guy. He had two sacks. He had, uh, you know, what, six total tackles. Um, About like 60. Yeah. I mean, I. it's like I, I, I keep wanting to curb my enthusiasm because he is a 24-year-old rookie. So he's an older rookie. Um, but, you know, he, he just makes plays. And I did see him get eaten up a couple times by big, big offensive tackles. Um, where he he couldn't you know disengage he couldn't use any any move to get away, but for the most part he it felt like he was making pretty much consistent pressures. Um, you know he had a nice pressure where he couldn't quite finish the tackle. It ended up being like what a thirteen yard gain with the quarterback scrambles to the outside. Um, but he was in the backfield a lot doing doing what he needed to do. He was making plays on special teams, and I think he played the entire game, mm-hmm. um, which you know. Again, I don't know. It's not like they have a ton of room at outside linebacker, but Ola being hurt, you know, having had his surgery, um, does that open the door for Tuzar Skipper to make this roster? I think the thing that stood out to me the most was not what he was able to do on the defensive side of the ball. I think it was, and we had we we literally just had this conversation before the game started. I know Derek had mentioned it, you know. You want to see him get some time on special teams because the Steelers have always had the expectation that their depth linebackers inside and outside are going to play special teams. And I think the fact that the Steelers took time to have him be on their special teams unit, and I believe he had two tackles on special teams tonight, you know, I think that speaks that the Steelers are trying to see what they have with him. Because you, you, you've seen the stats, you've seen the technique, you've seen the, the outbursts on the field where he's just making plays left and right. But can he pre- contribute on special teams? Can he be that guy for us if we put him on the roster? And I think he proved tonight on defense. I think he's proved all preseason on defense. Um, but I think the fact that he was able to play the entire game and do as well on special teams, I I know the numbers are tight. You have to find a way to get him on this roster. I mean, I know it's against uh, lower-tier guys, and there's a chance that he might be inactive every game. But with Ola's health being up in the air again going into the season, all you're left with is Watt, Dupree, and, and Chick. You know, do you really want to go in there with just three guys again? Or do you want to have a fourth guy who might not ever see the field, but, you know, as the year goes along, potentially force a rotation? And, you and know, I, you know, you, I think you want to go and give him the opportunity. Yeah, and I'm going to go uh, this step further. In in his first preseason, uh, Skipper has, has shown me more than Chick ever did. Yep. Um, as far as the the ability to be explosive and make plays and and, and cause havoc. Um, so, I, I mean, I – you know, I don't know that anybody was looking at this at the beginning of the season thinking, okay, Tuzar Skipper, this other guy from the Mac is going to be this explosive guy. Um, but it sure looks like that there's a kind of a diamond in the rough, a, uh, you know, another guy that they're pulling up who, who could grow into something. Um, so I, I'll be, it's like, I want to say I'll be surprised. I won't be surprised. Well, I won't be stunned. How about that? I won't be stunned if he doesn't make it and they try and move him on to the 53, but I don't think he'll get there because, again, I think he's shown enough that some other team would snap him up. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would be I would be surprised if he doesn't stay on the roster. Um, for the reasons you mentioned, you know, with depth, um, and I, I just feels like this is a guy who, even if you only have him in his prime for four or five years, during those four or five years, it feels like he could be very productive. Yep. Um, so, I, you know, if that's the way that feels. Now, the other guy that also kind of falls into this category is the president. 
<laughs> you know, we've decided that's your nickname, Mr. Gilbert. You're the president. Just live with it. Uh, so, yeah, Ulysses Gilbert blocks a kick. Um, he made his presence known on special teams. I saw him flying all around uh, on defense. Do you think he's done enough to earn his spot? And, again, now we're talking about – keeping two extra linebackers, is there room? You have, and I I said this earlier, you have to make room for the top 53 players. I mean, you can't keep, you know, 15 corners and one receiver. So there is (laughs) a question that goes along with it. But at the same time, if you have, if you have a player like Ulysses Gilbert, who you think can come in there and contribute on special teams and give you some potential long-term upside, because we've seen his athleticism, he's been all over the field. You know, it's not like we're looking at another you know, dirty red situation where you have a guy who is unathletic, but just a hard nosed, high octane football player. We're looking at a guy who's a hard nosed, high octane football player and athletic on top of it and has good instincts. You know, instincts were never an issue with Gilbert coming out. That was always the thing that I I targeted him in all my mock drafts later in the draft because he's a very instinctive football player who just needed more experience and room to grow. And I think the splash plays he's made on defense and the ability to to be a standout on special teams this preseason I don't know how you don't keep him. I think the 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 tipped uh, field goal tonight was just uh, the icing on top of the cake. You know, I think he locked this spot up probably about by week two, beginning of week three of the preseason. I think it, you have to find a way to keep him on there. You know, especially with the fact that you know Tyler Medikevich isn't guaranteed beyond this year. I think he has the upside to be a special teams phenom like Medikevich has been, um, but he also just gives you some better upside. I think to be on the defense. I think you have to find a way to keep him and Skipper. But that's Taking away someone else, I understand the issues that might be with that, but you have to keep the best 53. And if Gilbert, you believe, is one of those best 53 and you think Skipper is one of the best 53, you're going to have to find somewhere else where you might have to look for some versatility from other guys to fill roles at those positions, kind of like the safety cornerback where you have you know, Hilton and Sutton who can play safety and kind of safety or something or leave one extra alignment, throw a guy in the practice squad. you got to do something because you can't leave those two off the roster, in my opinion. Yeah. Now – uh, I know that uh, there's likely to be a lot of talk about J. Ron Elliott uh, because of his strip sack and uh, recovery and 988-yard run back for a touchdown. I mean, he's very – obviously, he just got there. Um, I don't – you know, he hasn't been there for the full preseason. Maybe that play earns him a, a, a practice squad nod. But I, there's – you know, again, he that one play is not going to get him a, a spot at linebacker on this team right now. Um, but do you think he that that made enough of an impact? Maybe that, that they make go okay. You're a practice squad guy. I don't know, is he even eligible for the practice squad at this point? I mean, he's 27. He'll be 28. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, he's been in the league since 2014. You know, I, I think that's really what the one thing that kind of stands out to me is the fact that he was a veteran player coming in, made a vet savvy move. I mean, he has experience in the league, but I, I I like him. I, I just I, I think that was more a standout for another team elsewhere. I mean, if he's a practice squad player, by all means, throw him on there. I wouldn't mind it. I just I don't know if he's eligible or not at this point at that age. Well, um, you, you knew more about him than I did. I hadn't paid enough attention. Um, <laughs> so at twenty seven, I would I, I rescind my comments. Forget it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not hundred percent certain. I just I, if, I think that was more. Uh, we needed some depth for him in there. I I think that's why he played as well as he did tonight. This isn't his first rodeo. I mean, he's been in the league now for five years. Yeah. Um, but I think that was more of a nice little audition tape for someone. He could be one of these guys where he's sitting at home for a little bit here and the Steelers call him back up mid season. If they have an injury and need to add someone to the roster, they at least have a relationship now and got somewhere to trust them. But you know, I, I think one week isn't enough time to make an impact on a team to snag up a roster spot. Um, and I don't he, I think he's only had, I don't know how many clean seasons he has, but I think he was when he was drafted by or went undrafted by the Packers. I think he was on um, their actual 53 man roster all three of the years he was there. So I think he is officially done with practice squad i'm not 100 certain yeah in which case i think it's yeah i think he's a sayonara so yeah. um i think as as much as some people will hate this um and i'm not sure that i am in love with it but i think dan big dan makes the team again um he he just he does enough that you know he, he, i don't know how they can not t- put him on but i also think that uh, you know, but Isaiah Bugs did not have a great game last game, but I thought he was decent today, um, and I think he might, you know, make his case for being on the fifty-three. It just depends on on how much depth they're going to go. And again, the D line, 
that's a potential spot because I they obviously I know um, McCullers is not going to be practice. I don't think he's practice squad eligible at all. He's been on the team what four years now. Yeah, um, so he, so it's, already. it's either he's on the team or he's not. Uh, yeah. And I, I again, I don't think you get bugs all the way through. Uh, maybe, maybe, but. You know, I think Mondo uh, has has done enough to maybe be a practice squad eligible guy or, or get a nod for that. Yeah. Um, but again, I don't know how you know if you decide to keep the the two extra linebackers um, because again, I I don't I said at the beginning of the preseason there was a chance Tyler Matikavich could find his way off the team. He has had a really good preseason, um, and I will give him credit for that. Dirty Red has played some really good football. Um, I don't want him to see him starting. I don't want to see him in coverage, but I don't think that they're going to part ways with him yet, uh, especially because he's still under contract. But, you know, as you said, he's only sealed up for this season. After this season, I don't know. Um, and especially with these younger guys. But, you know, if you're going to keep Matikevich and uh, Skipper and Gilbert, well, you got to make room someplace, right? And it's possible that they, they, they have to decide we're not going to keep an extra guy that we would have kept on the D-line. Um, but, you know, when, what do you think about uh, Bugs and McCullers? I think I think uh, Big Dan's earned a spot. I mean, I think last year we kind of saw a little bit of a transformation with him with Carl Dunbar and his coaching style and how it kind of is pandering to his skill set, um, just his personality. Because, you know, not I, a lot of people don't understand the concept that not every single coaching style is is good for every single uh, player type. You know, there is a lot of men blending there. And John Mitchell's, you know, been one of the most underrated and praised D-line coaches at the same time in the NFL over the last however many years. Um, but it, sometimes it doesn't work with every player. And I think what we've seen with Big Dan is he's playing with much more aggression than he has. He's playing with better pad level for a six foot eight shade tree. Um, you know, I think he's doing a lot more to kind of make him seem like he deserves to be here. And I think he's a very good depth player. I know a lot of fans will cringe at those words, but I think for what you, he presents in some of the two, you know, the heavy packages on the goal line or even some of the plays he came into last year where he was just disruptive and was able to walk the center back and get a hand in the quarterback's face to throw the play completely off. He does that well enough to keep him there. I think he is the fifth best D lineman on the roster. But with Bugs and Mondo, I think Mondo is probably going to be a practice squad player. The thing that I don't know how it's going to play out is if they want to keep Bugs or not, because Bugs has shown flashes of a very, um, very good depth D lineman who could potentially make the strides down the road. I think he's better at this point than LT Watt was as a rookie. He's definitely better than uh, Sex Machine last year was, uh, uh, Joshua Frazier. Yeah. Uh, but I think he, he, it depends on if they want to lo lose him or keep him or not, stash him on the practice squad and call him up if an injury happens. Because I don't think he's been consistent enough that he, I think he would even dress for a game. I think he's going to be one of the hats that would be out if he is making the 53-man roster. The consistency has been an issue, which isn't surprising to me. Um, but I think Mondo has done well enough to earn a practice squad spot. And I think he's going to be one of the guys that they target. Um, it'll just be... It's tough to call on Bugs. I think Bugs is a potential casualty if they don't want to keep him there because, just, just like I said, because of how inconsistent he has been. But I like him. I like his long-term upside if he can level that out a little bit and work with Dunbar some more. But, you know, the, the roster number's tight. Depends on where they want to get, keep guys and where they want to move them. So. Yeah, I thought Justin Lane has played better progressively through the preseason. Unfortunately, he had a bad play tonight, but it was right after apparently he was injured. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll give him a pass on that. Uh but, you know, I think – I don't know whether he'll make the 53 or not. Um, I think he probably will. But he, he also, again, is a guy they could potentially try and push onto the practice squad. But uh, I, I'm betting that he's probably got a position. Um, I thought Cam Kelly uh, has done – certainly done enough to to probably warrant a, a, a roster spot. Um, and – you know the other guy that I wanted to talk about because he's been a, a one of those again he's a fan favorite uh, and everybody fell in love with him was Sutton Smith. I think Sutton Smith is practice squad or gone. Mm -hmm. um, I you know and it, again it's availability is your best ability. He has not been available. Um, he had some nice plays tonight, but again it, it's a level of competition to a certain extent and and the, and the body of work just isn't there. I don't know how they could and again they just aren't going to have room for yet another outside linebacker. Um, I, the best I think he could be hope, hoping for is a practice squad spot. 
Um, is there anybody else that you thought uh, made a case or that you're looking at and going, I think that they're they're okay? I think Justin Lane makes the uh, makes the roster. I don't think it's because of his skill. I think it's because of the fact that you spend a third round draft pick on him. I think it's kind of hard to cut a guy that's that pedigree yeah. right now. And he kind of knew he was a, a a rough player. I thought he was a little rougher than I expected him to be, um, just based on his inexperience. He's only been playing corner for what two years, three years now. Yeah. Um, so, but he has the traits, and there were some nice plays he did. But if this injury turns out to be more, I think he's a prime IR candidate, just because you don't plan on playing him this year. He's not going to ever see the field this year. He's probably going to be inactive some of the games. So why waste a rush spot on? He's injured. If, the, if this injury is anything, that's significant. And I think you're looking at an IR guy for the year to help the Steelers kind of free up that spot and give him another op- some flexibility. Absolutely. Around, which I think would be very beneficial to them. If you don't plan on playing lane, why have him on the roster? Why risk practice squad when there's the IR that seems to be just a magical thing for teams to throw players they don't want to deal with right now on? But um, I think I think Cam Kelly's your third safety. Um, we're going off of that. I think he's done everything the Steelers have asked him to. I think he's clicked very well, and it's kind of crazy to think of his story where not too long ago he looked like his career was done after the AAF disbanded, and now he's going to be playing meaningful snaps with the Steelers secondary trying to make a Super Bowl run. You know, it's kind of an awesome up-and-coming story. But the, the battle I wanted to see tonight that I was kind of disappointed with um, because I've been very high on him since last year was Marcus Allen. And he had the, he called the start today by the looks of it. Um, and I think him and with the emergence of Cam Kelly, I don't think they keep five safeties. I don't think they have a reason to keep five safeties with right. Hilton and uh, Cam Sutton's flexibility and versatility. Um, I thought Allen had a prime opportunity to kind of try to make a case for himself. I, I just, as much as it kills me to say, because I've been a fan of his for a while, he just didn't do enough. I think to warrant a roster spot, and I know that's tough. I think he's a practice squad candidate. Um, I just don't think that he earned his earned a spot on the fifty-three man roster. I think Dangerfield plays that dime backer, reserve safety, special teams ace role that you need from that number four safety. Um, and I don't think he did enough to earn meaningful snaps on defense over Cam Kelly, over Terrell Evans or Sean Davis, especially, or even Jordan Dangerfield. So I think Davis or Allen had a chance to look. And make a name for himself. I don't think he did. I think he'll be on the practice squad this year. That's just my stance on it. But um, on that defensive side of the ball, really, I, I thought the guys you needed to see stand out stood out. Um, you know, like Skipper and Gilbert. Um, and I think you know the way that Kelly played this offseason, he or this I keep saying offseason, this preseason. Um, I think he made a name for himself. I think he's going to be a fixture in that secondary, maybe depending on how this whole Sean Davis uh, contract situation goes, you have a, a position where you have uh, Cam Kelly as your starting safety in 2020. Right. You know, it's, I think it's kind of a cool ascension for him, but um, I, I think the roster cuts are going to be a lot more cut and dry than we were making them out to be. Um, but I also think that there's always one or two surprises you don't see coming every single year. Um, a name gets cut that you thought was going to stick and someone makes the roster where you thought they had, a, you know, had no chance at all to make it. Um, but I think for the most part, there's only a couple players that truly are on the bubble. You know, I think the bulk of the team, I'd say about 40 to 43 of them are pretty much locks. You know, you're going to have a couple yeah. people here or there that are going to link on there. But I think you saw what you needed to see today. And I, I was pleased by the guys that I was hoping would do well to kind of really make it hard for the Steelers to cut them. And if they do cut them, prove them wrong. But um, I thought it was just a very vanilla experience for the most part. <laughs> Yeah, now I, I I've left this for last because it's it's probably the position of most concern, and it's the position that again tonight was extremely non-existent, which is why I didn't bring it up till now. And that's the tight end position. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Xavier Grimble is your is as Kevin Colbert said in an interview prior to the game, he's technically your number two. Where the hell was he tonight? <laughs> um, I don't see know if he played or not. I haven't seen him. To yeah. Be honest. You didn't see him at all. I know Christian Scotland Williamson. Uh, he got he got snaps, but again, didn't make any kind of contribution. Zach Gentry got a ball thrown at him or, or two, um, which I think one was t- taken away from him and picked off with that bizarre interception. Um, and I I'm a little concerned at this point now that they got basically zero production in this game out of the tight end position. Uh, they really haven't gotten much production out of the tight end position throughout the preseason. 
it, you know, it, Vance McDonald has not been a guy who plays 16 games. If you if Vance McDonald goes down, that's a, a weakness on this team. It's probably, in my mind, the weakness on this team. Um, and now we're going to get into speculation, but do you see I, – I kind of see them doing something. I don't know what it'll be. I don't know whether they're just going to wait and see who gets cut and try and pick somebody up. I cannot see them going into the into the season at this point with McDonald, Grimble, and Gentry. No, I think Gentry is a uh, practice squad lock at this point in time. Yeah. I thought he did well. I thought he did well during training camp. Um, once the you know once the bullets started flying during the actual action of the preseason, I thought he kind of disappeared a little bit. Um, I think his biggest issue is, and this is not that surprising at all, is his blocking. Yeah, I think his blocking is what's going to keep him off the 53-man roster and potentially be an issue in his career. If he can work on it, I think he has a value um, with the Steelers and somewhere in the league, if not with the Steelers. Um, but I think this year will be another redshirt year. And it's just, you know, it's not that he's a bad receiver, but that blocking, there's none. Um, I, I, you know, I think Kevin Rader is a wash. You know, I think uh, your, your years in Joe's favorite, Woods, the long snapper, tight end, Wash, you know, I think I, I think Xavier Grimble is the number two. I think he, I mean, I've been supporting him. Um, I don't think he's spectacular by any means, but I think they're they're going to be looking for somebody else. They're going to sign somebody else. They're going to make a trade for somebody. I think you kind of have to at this point in time. I don't know if they'll go for someone to replace Grimble as the number two, or just look for some depth behind McDonald in general and kind of just have Grimble and the other guy kind of be a fluid two uh, A and two B. Um, but, you know, like you said, we haven't seen McDonald play a 16-game season to the point where we feel comfortable saying that doesn't matter what happens. He's going to be there to be healthy. He just doesn't have that. His, his style of game does not promote that type of health because he plays with his nose down. He looks to murder people on the field yeah. <laughs> and be a grown-ass man. So those type of players don't play 16 games because they get banged up a little bit. So you're, you expect that someone else is going to be taking snaps at tight end for the Steelers this year, not named Vance McDonald. And I don't think that person is also on the roster right now. I think Xavier Grimble is going to be the guy that comes in first. I think they're going to have almost a two tight end set type of deal where they're rotating guys in and out. I don't think that guy's on the roster. Gentry is not ready. Raider is not there. And Christian Scotland Williamson is definitely not that player. You know, he's going to be along for new learning this year, but that's about it. So I'd be amazed. I think that's the only position that the Steelers will make a move for once cuts start happening. Um, once teams start opening up for trade trading when they're trying to get rid of players they don't want after the deadline. So um, I, 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 it was painful to see. It's been a very lackluster uh, preseason for that tight end group who really had an opportunity to make a name for themselves considering the depth at the position. Yeah. And, and no one took that jump to grab the position by the horns and run with it. So um, we'll see how this – I think it's going to be the e easily the most interesting development over the next week or so for the Steelers. Yeah. So I, I I really wanted to not talk about the the guys in the striped uh, outfits tonight. I didn't want to have to do my hashtag the refs stink, um, and you know because look this is the kind of game you expect a ton of penalties in because it's all guys who are um, you know not top level players for the most part. So you expect a lot of holding. You expect there to be issues. You expect the refs to throw a lot of flags. But and I know you know what I'm going to talk about here. Um, at least I think you might. Uh, how, how, how do you not know that that pass is not incomplete? How do you somehow let that play run uh, and then and then affirmatively say incomplete pass? What are you thinking? <laughs> uh, no, they they they're in they're in mid season form at this point in time, and it was very. Very, very painful. I've come to expect nothing from those guys. I've come to expect absolutely nothing. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. And whoever was the head referee tonight was annoying me. I don't know. He, he, he has no chin. Um, <laughs> he just <laughs> bothered me. Uh, every time we'd get up there, I just kept going, you're a melon head. And <laughs> the refs stink. Uh, I, I'm going to – I want a week in my life where I don't have to say it. That's all I'm saying. I want a week in my life where I don't have to say the refs stink, but I don't expect that to ever happen. <laughs> it's, you're just you're hoping for something that's impossible. <laughs> so I think that'll probably wrap it up for us here. Again, the Steelers dropped this game. They end the preseason three and one. Um, I, I'm 
I'm very overall. I'm very happy with the way the preseason played out. Uh, I look forward to seeing this team open open the season. I I still have high expectations for them. Uh, I expect them to win the division. I don't look. I don't expect them to go sixteen and zero. Uh, and I I you know I will. I'm sure all of us are going to have our uh, projections up sometime this week. What we expect the Steelers to do, but. Uh, I don't expect them to go 16 and 0, but I do expect them to pull this division out, and I don't expect it to be um, like down to the wire the way it was last season. But we'll, you know, that 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 could be the homer in me. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's just uh, I, I feel comfortable. Other than the areas that I that I talked about, and primarily it's the tight end area that that makes me feel a little nervous. I'm happy with the the way the starters have performed in their limited. Uh, you know, capacity. Um, and, and we've got some guys that maybe we can be excited about that we didn't know anything about prior. So that's, you know, that's all you really want out of the preseason. Give me somebody to, to cheer for. Um, and I think we've got those guys in, in guys like Gilbert and Skipper. Um, and, uh, we'll see what, ha- we'll see what happens. Um, Zach, you got anything you want to, uh, leave out there as your closing thoughts for the preseason? I think there's a lot to be excited about this year. I'm excited to see the Steelers put last year behind and, you know, shut out all the noise and, uh, you know, keep pushing forward and take every game as an opportunity to get better. And hopefully it finishes up with a uh, seventh Lombardi coming back to the Steel City. Absolutely. All right. So that's going to wrap it up for this edition of the Steel City Underground podcast. Uh, Again, my name's Brian. His name's Zach. And as I always like to tell you, it's chaos out there. So be kind. We would like to thank you for listening and remind our listeners to follow us on social media and our website, www.steelcityunderground.com. 